Okay, ready to go? Not that we really need it. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to welcome you all here again. We can't see anything, but um, uh, we'll carry on anyway. Um, so today we're just going to go on with the... Uh, it's, it's an older um, option in 12D. Um, so uh, part of the process was to have a bit of an awareness uh, about what's in 12D as well. And it's surprising how often that can, that can help you. Um, so it, it is the, the uh, a option for doing um, the overlay and widening. Um, I think somebody mentioned the other day that it was one of the, the biggest panels in 12D. Um, so um, uh, uh, Rich would be pretty proud of that. Um, so um, and it's, it's it's one of those jobs that you that you come up against in everything. You've got to do an overlay job. Um, they tell you that the, the you get a good survey. It's always a good idea when you, if you you know are getting a survey that. If you are doing an overlay and widening job, that they pick up things the way you want it. Lots of those little undulations and changes in the crossfall across lanes, because it makes a big difference when you do that overlay to get the, the, the that purpose running. Um, so it's it's the same old story. They say um, we're going to do a hundred mil overlay, and and they've got a budget of nothing, and um, uh, they expect you to come up with a, a profile, a row profile that's going to be exactly hundred mil, no problems, and. You know, so we all know that that doesn't work. Um, so the overlay option is is a guide um, to give you an idea of of, of, of what's going to happen, what surfaces you're going to get, uh, how, how deep that your design tin is uh, uh, over the over the actual existing using isopax, and uh, so you'd be able to look at it and have a bit of an idea of where you, where you can achieve uh, 100 mil or so, whether you're sneaking out to 150 or even a bit more for some deep lift, or you've got areas where it's just not going to work. Um, so, so then you've got the, the process. So it's really a tool. It's not a, it's not a, an option to uh, press, and you've you've got your overlay design job done. Um, it's an option to to uh, look at the surface, get some trial levels, and then uh, you have to make your mind up then what you're going to do with those uh, levels you've got in creating your ultimate alignment string. Um, you, know, you also take into account. Um, uh, standard cross falls, uh, you know, minus three to start with, existing cross falls to match that, then possibly super elevation on top of that. So that's when you, when you get the super elevation part, that's when you finally realise that you're not going to do the overlay job they started you with. Uh, you're going to end up with, you know, major reconstructions all over the place. So that's how most things generally go, I feel. So um, we've got the uh, uh, design um, uh, uh, overlay. Um, so basically it's on the toolbar there as well. So it is a pretty big panel, isn't it? Mm. Um, got lots of little tabs, but generally it's um, uh, reasonably straightforward. Um, so again, what you start with is your good survey. Um, uh, this is a pretty old job, this one. I, I've got a sneaky suspicion it was a TMR job. Um, and um, <coughs> so you end up with over overlay design strings. Um, this is part of an old training job we used to do. Um, so it's got a full road reconstruction area that you, that you uh, probably may not be interested in doing the overlay on. And you've got the, a start part and an end bit. Um, so you've got some strings um, that would uh, more, more, more than likely be your picked up um, uh, row crown and some cutback strings. So the cutback strings can be the existing strings on the, on the edge of bitumen or, they, or you can create some strings and, uh, as an offset or something and just drape it onto the, onto the tin. But you've got some sort of cutback area. Uh, there are options in the overlay design panel uh, to, to use offsets, but most people draw strings um, as, their, as their starting point. Um, so luckily, because um, uh, we've um, got one prepared before, but you, when you fill this data out normally, uh, you, you can write out to a, to a file so you can bring it back. It's not a recalc as such, but it does bring the file back. It's the next best thing. Um, and then we'll go and clean all the data out and, and rerun. So you can have different scenarios different options or depths and all sorts of things and have different uh, types that you can trial. So we've already got one here prepared before. So it's um, a normal, normal, uh, normal uh, application with uh, minus 3% cross ball. So that's what I made it. 
Um, so it just fills out the, um, the, the panel if you hit the read button. And um, so you've got options in here to, to um, uh, uh, sample. Um, so you can actually, most people pick a, a, a tin surface, uh, but you can use cross sections and that sort of stuff as well. But most times we just go uh, from the, 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 uh, the uh, tin surface. As I said, we, we've got the, the people to pick it up, so we've got lots of undul uh, undulations that, we can, uh, that may, may affect our overlay. So you've got um, you know, normal sort of things, separation, left side, right side. Um, got a couple of different overlay modes. Um, normal mode, we'll just start with that and we'll look at some of these other ones. Um, we pick our reference alignment and um, uh, the, the, the reference alignment I've picked here at the moment um, uh, has no vertical on it. Okay, so it's just down the centre of the road. Uh, there's a survey row crown string there, obviously that wanders a little bit. Um, but the, uh, what I'm after is to get sample points on that reference alignment. Um, so then I can start to look at uh, my final uh, grading designs. So that's the whole process. Um, the, the, we do have a, um, a uh, maximum longitudinal changes in grade. Um, that's not going to do something wonderful for you. Um, it's just going to be out in the report file and give you some changes in grade that you don't, uh, that your, your, um, lim you know, your actual limitation. Uh, so it's not going to fix it all for you. You've still got to grade it. Um, but in the report file, it will tell you what areas that happened at. Um, you know, so um, the, we're doing section mode. So down the bottom here, we've just worked out um, uh, we're going to do the road over section because we've got the, the reconstruction in the middle. So we're doing this bit and then we're doing that bit up there. But you can just do the whole job if you, if you want to. Uh, we're going to set the job up. So um, there's uh, a few different uh, ways to start with. Uh, we, we're just going to start with um, uh, minus 3% crossbore. Okay, so we just want to do that. Um, and, um, and, and just run it and see what it actually looks like. There's a good chance it's not going to look good. Um, so it, it's going to um, you know, um, cut down in areas where the, the road changes, the road, the existing road super elevating. It's not going to uh, 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 you know, fix that at all. But there might be areas where there, there is you know, a 3% cross ball, 2.5% cross ball, something like that. So we'll, we'll help you there. Um, so same for the right side. Um, basically, just picked your, your um, uh, uh, the, the edge string which is the left edge string, right edge string. I picked these ones here uh, earlier, so I just tick them on, but uh, normally the, the, you wouldn't have these picked. You just pick the edge string and you say, my cross ball is minus 3%. You can get tricky and go into this table here and apply over chain these ranges, different cross balls. But oh, I haven't never done it. Um, so minimum depth, uh, an overall one, uh, 0 0.1. Um, must be in the early days when depths were positive. <laughs> They're negative now, aren't they? <laughs> um, so um, you, can, you, you can put that part in. Uh, results. Um, what it's going to create for me. Um, the, the clean rolls beforehand is a good idea. And um, then it's got, it'll create cross sections and overlay strings for you. Um, it'll create not a model for cross fall strings, uh, which, is, which is a pretty handy little thing. So what it does, it creates strings that look like they're on top of the cutback strings, uh, but the Z value is a, is, is a cross fall. Um, so you can turn, toggle your Z value on and, and it's, it's, it's reflecting cross balls for you. So it's pretty handy. Um, so uh, you've also got a uh, little points created and they're the minimum maximum points uh, uh, at the centre line. Um, so when you decide to look at your, uh, your uh, vertical geometry, you can add those little points on you can see the maximum and the, and the actual minimum. Um, and, I'll, and I'll explain those in a moment. And you've got a range file and stuff like that, and you've got an overlay report file and volume report file and so forth. Um, so you've got an overlay um, tin. So you, so you wanted to create a tin surface. So we're only talking about the, the, the overlay strings, you know, the edge side. That's all it is. It's not your whole road design. It's just a little path that's the, where your cutback strings are. So it's going to create a tin like that for you. All right. And you'll be able to, and it also does um, a, uh, isopax or depth range. So if you set up a, a decent depth range file, it'll also do that for you. So if you go into here and open that up, it's, it, it'll do that. So we, we're, we're looking at the areas that we're interested in. Obviously, we want to know the bad areas, so, and uh, either way, so whether it's red and the, and, the, and the one above, the brown ones. We start to look at the ones between 0 and 50 mil, 50 mil to 90, 90 to 100, uh, and that's just, so we, we're looking at 
you know, around the 50, we're probably maybe not too bad with 150. Um, but sometimes the other areas that you get, maybe on the outside of the road, uh, where it, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a false thing, you, you, but you'll visually be able to see that um, uh, it's always going to be a, a large value because of, of the, of the uh, process of your road. Um, so you can do all that. And um, you can also go um, and, uh, if I go into my ISO packet view here before we go, so we'll go and tabulate that. Um, so we want to grab uh, depth and the range file we want is that one. And the uh, units is meters. And we want to spot over there somewhere. And um, we'll call this, I should take Paul's idea and never type. Now, I can't believe, I'll just finish this for a minute, that have you ever seen a panel like that before? A few times. <laughs> um, this gives you an idea and probably how, how, and a reflection on how old I am. Um, um, I wrote that um, when we didn't even have a, uh, a, um, a text button where you could press and fill out a, a, a tables. So that's what we used to do. Um, so you could go to the, 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 the defaults and set things like all this, where you never actually had a button on the, on the text thing to do. Oh, yeah. And it hasn't been changed yet. And so I probably just got myself a job. So if I um, uh, add in the uh, overlay table, um, there it is. So it gives you an idea. Um, uh, or maybe it's too good, that's it, as good as it is, isn't it, really? Yeah. Uh, it could be a lot better than that. Um, but anyway, it's a visual thing. You can look at the colours and see an idea of, of, of what's going on. Um, so back in our, our job, um, we're looking at the, the overlay. Um, it has a, uh, a scarification as well. Um, I remember back in the days when we, we were working with Richard on doing this, um, and we put that in. Um, a lot of times, I'll, I'll show you how it works. Uh, but a lot of times, people can do their scarification areas. They they, uh, they may uh, locate that area and then create a little tin surface and create a super tin of them of their, on their own. Um, you know, where where things are going to be chopped off. But at least this will give you a bit of a feel for where it's, where it actually happens. Um, plots. Um, not really sure why we put that in. Um, but it'll, it'll, it'll do a plot of what you've got. So they're, they're pretty boring cross-sections. They're just uh, two points on either side, so I'm not too sure uh, whether that's worthwhile. Um, nowadays, with the advancement in plots, the spreadsheet one will also um, uh, give you a CSV file. Probably not a real advantageous one nowadays. Uh, uh, with all the, uh, You can go in there and, and manually edit the alignment string uh, vertical geometry, but... Most people, are, with the tools we've got in the super alignment, they really do it all in there. Um, so, so we go back to our setup and uh, so forth, and uh, we've got all our bits and pieces. Uh, so again, we're doing a uh, minus crossfall. Um, uh, this is just replacing the file, because obviously I've prepared it before. Um, so if I look at the overlay death polygons, um, that's your, your death polygons. Okay, so again, we're looking at the... Um, I probably might add to the isofact view, might help. Right, so you can sort of see straight away that, yeah, they've got all these brown areas there, so there's a good chance something's happening around there. And, um, yeah, you, you wouldn't expect something good straight away um, between, you know, like this minus 3% crosswalk. It doesn't reflect the, the road. Um, so if I go to my um, view here and I get rid of those isofacts, and we'll add in the... Um, uh, the overlay sections and strings. And I'll go have a look at them. Right, so we go to our cross section view and profile one of those. We'll say maybe that one there. Right, so you'll notice too that the isopacks are all nicely coloured, um, but so are the cross sections. Um, which at the time I thought was a great idea, and I still think it is. Um, so you can step through that, back and forwards. You don't have to go out to the to the uh, that plan view to see where uh, the 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 good area was or the colour. So the cross sections are coloured to match the the actual uh, isopacks or the or, or the depth polygons. Mm. So um, 
So you run that, that, that process as I'm stepping through, I go, yeah, okay, that looks fine, but yeah, my row is nothing like that. Um, yeah, so there might be a few spots where, where, where it matches and it quickly gets out of, out of control. Um, so, yeah, so at least that way you still be able to see that. And then you turn around and you go, okay, well, I might have a look at um, the, uh, those little points and, and add them in. No, where are we? Minimum maximum points. And I thought these are the minimum maximum points. So what are they actually getting those little red and yellow points from? So what you've got is this is the way it does it. Okay, so, um, um, so it, it's going to look at your tin surface. It's going to work its way down across and it's going to find the, 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 the highest point on that part of the tin, do a, a normal depth on that for the overlay and then project back to the centre line at the 3% cross balls that, you, that I've specified at this moment. And it gives you two points. Okay, so there is a grade on one of the, of the uh, centre lines now um, in, that, in that overlay strings model that has all those levels on it. Um, so um, if I go back to my long section, I profile one of those. So I'm after the, um, the there's my cutback reference and then, then there's actual re the retain more one. There's a super alignment one. So I go and um, look at the super alignment one. Um, that made a copy of my super alignment that I picked. Remember I said it had no levels? Okay, so I've made a copy of my super alignment and put the highest point of, of those two points on that uh, vertical geometry for me. It was pretty good. Um, in the middle, I didn't do anything, so obviously you'd expect it to look like that. Um, so you're only interested in this bit, and you're only interested in that bit. Um, so uh, at the moment, you know, like, sure, you're going grey between those dots and that sort of stuff. I'll add the little dots on. I don't think on the view there. I used to always watch um, people when I was younger taking glasses on and off, and I used to say, poor buggers. Um, <laughs> but so nowadays, uh, so we go back to our, our view, we're looking at this sort of profile, and we're saying, okay, we've got a, uh, you know, it's not really indicative of what's going on. Um, so I maybe have to have a look at uh, a, a new option. Um, so if I go up and I go uh, grab this one, and I read that in. Right, so now I've got a, the same option again, and I'm doing just normal, normal process, but I want to look at the crossball a little bit better. So what you've got an option there is to load crossballs from strings, and that's what I've done. But I had to pick my my row crown string. So I just turn that little guy off. Um, so I pick my row, my surveyed row crown string, go load from cross force, and it gives you this table. And that's just a reflection of the existing road. Okay, so we had an option to do this well. You can actually edit that, that, that table, right? And you can actually delete things out and, and you can sort of manage the, 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 the cross fall of the road via that table. Um, uh, you know, and uh, again, if you're not going to end up doing any super elevation, that sort of stuff on your, on your actual road, and you, are, you do want to manage that cross fall. It's nice to be able to get rid of um, uh, some actual values. Um, maybe we should load the cross falls first. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you can see they're all odd little values, you know, but, but you, you can still get an idea of where that cross fall change might be. So you might be able to delete lines in that file. I can do it now. Um, but delete a few lines out, put a few cross balls in there so, and smooth the road out. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's the actual process. Um, so is, remember, this is all still uh, a procedure to get your centre line and get it in, in a level on it that, that matches your, uh, your final design line. It's not taking into account all the outside design and that sort of stuff, it's just the centre line. So again, we can look at that and we can go right side, um, low cross balls from string and we can go uh, overlay. So I'll replace those two. For now, I'll go back to my isopacks and things like that. They're starting to look a little bit um, different. A little bit, there? no browns. Yeah, so I'm looking more towards these sorts of things. Um, so if I look to my cross sections, and I go back and profile one of those. Right, it's really just running along the existing road. Um, and 100 mil bar, roughly. Yeah. And um, um, sometimes that's all they do. You, you often see roads where they've gone and upgraded them all, and all they do is follow the, follow the road. Oh, and, uh, make all. it 100 mil yeah. and you're done. Um, so, so at least that way you've, you've got an idea, you can quickly step through, see the cross sections, 
It's still doing the, 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 the highest point and, uh, across the tin and projecting across the center line, but it's sort of matching the existing road, basically. Um, so then you've got the, the, the process where you might, uh, uh, again, look at that and, um, and then say, okay, well, you know, um, uh, what if I, my road does have super elevation on it and I want to be able to see what those things look like. But at the moment, in my design road here, if I add in the, the uh, overlay uh, cross-fall strings, again, they're the ones that um, uh, have the uh, Z values on them, or the, or the, or the cross-falls. So that level represents the cross-fall, um, so it's pretty handy. Uh, and when I go to my um, long section here, I can also add in those uh, cross fall strings and um, uh, set my corridor out a little bit so I can um, see them. So if I go, say, six metres either side. I've got a profile my right string, actually. Just super one rather than the one one again. Uh, overlay. No, no, just profile the overlay. Super one. Mm, that's the one I had to put out. Yeah, no, no. You got the actual reference ring. That's got the other one. Yeah, no, no. No, that's the actual reference ring. Do you want yeah, to over that? Yeah, that's the one I want, though. Yeah, okay. Well, there, where's my super? There you go. Here it is. Zooming in now. Um, let's see, that should have been on there. Cross overlay strings. Oh, what do I call them? Overlay cross ball strings. Ah, there you go. Um, right, so it'll it'll show you, you know. Um, so, so I've got super elevation on that on my actual center line. Okay, so you can sort of see what they what they look like cross ball wise. It usually looks like rubbish, yeah. and um, you know. So so that, and this is what leads you through to making a a decision. Uh, am I going to you know? Do a bit more. Am I going to super elevate this road, or I'm just going to do a little 100 mil overlay, mass resistant cross ball, maybe touch up in a few spots, and uh, so that's the idea of the overlay thing. It's working its way through for you. Um, so um, again, you can then you can go back and um, uh, again look at your setup here, and you can run um, uh, uh, options saying use cross balls only. Um, you just end up with the outside strings projected back to the centre line at your cross ball. So it's not a real, not too many times that people nowadays. Uh, grade that outside string, uh, but but you, you can if you have the edge string and grade it yourself and project it back. Um, but uh, some of those options are uh, probably being taken over by some of the the the, the um, uh, super alignment options we've got and and uh, uh, processes that we've got now when this force was actually first done. We've got this one here, so we've got um, the the um, left super elevation. So I turn that on, I go low cross balls from string. Because yeah, as you can see, the string I've got here has super elevation on it. And I go to the, the next one here and load cross ball from strings. So you, you expect to see really nice cross balls because it gets the super elevation information from the super alignment and populates the cross ball for you. So then I go overlay on that one. And I go back to my cross sections here and I start looking at my overlay design now. And we'll step through our, our sections. And you'll see that the... the, the I don't know if I got that it actually looks like a big bone one, see? It's around here somewhere. Oh, 4%, 4%. Hmm. Yeah, so you can see like back on these ones here, a little bit more more obvious, um, following the actual you know, super elevation. So there's values there that are not like um, this one there. Um, nothing like the existing rows. So it's all straight through cross ball, matching whatever my, my, my super is going to be. Um, so it's it's a combination of how you work your way through. You start off with just a normal 3% cross ball, and it produces a, a few things, and you start to realise that by the time I look at these um, uh, isopacks in here, I'm starting to get different changes. I'm starting to look them after more after the the, the, the yellow green areas uh, and that sort of stuff. But there will be areas on the outside, those big brown ones out there, um, which will reflect 
um, this sort of area uh, where the super elevation has gone out and you're nowhere near 100 mil anymore. Um, so so that's, that's the sort of process that you go through. So you start with that, that, that existing, mass existing road and finally you end up uh, uh, possibly going to the, to the super elevation of that diagram. Um, so um, when, you, when you finally, it's, it's just a bit of an iterative process going back and forwards and that sort of stuff to, to, to get what you finally uh, uh, like. Um, so you see there, the, they're, the, they're the edge strings now, okay, because they, they, and they should match the existing super, which they do. Um, I had the Durrell squiggly before um, because they were getting cross falls from the, from the uh, existing road. Now I'm, I'm using the super elevation mode. Um, they follow the cross fall of the, of the um, uh, centre line, which is what you'd expect. Um, so, if I just get rid of that. All right, so I've still got these sorts of ones in here and I've, and I've got the, the, um, uh, the centre line uh, of, my, of my road. It's giving me a bit of an indication. Um, I can read in the Scarify one, which just basically says, look, I've got a couple of areas where I want to be able to, to um, oh, I must have lost it. Sigma. That's it. Right, so, so, so it, it turns around looking at this area here and I'm sort of looking at uh, depths that I'm going to uh, put in here to cut some of the existing road out uh, and then run the overlay function over top of that. Um, so, so when you go and run the overlay on that, it'll then turn around and if I regenerate that, it then cuts the road. You can see the, the, those points are down there now instead of being up the top. Um, so, so it'll s then sample those points um, for you instead of looking at the, at the existing road. Um, so it's, it's one of those things, um, you know, like if you, if you uh, have those isolated areas, as I said, a lot of people sometimes just lo uh, lo uh, locate those areas themselves and do a bit of a tin thing and they make it the part of their, of their actual uh, super tin process. Um, so in the, um, the results tab here, um, there's options to transfer the Z values that you've got on your on your um, uh, copied overlay string uh, to your road centre line. Okay, so it, it'll then copy all those little straight little points you've got um, for you. So you got, you've now got a start point. Um, so it's done all those calculations for you, uh, giving you a bit of an idea as you work your way through um, by the isopax, uh, analysing what you're doing. Then I finally just put these points on your centre line for you. Uh, then that's the end of it. Um, so you've, you've used this tool to to look at the road, analyse it, and you've now got to go and grade your centre line. But that's still not an easy process um, because you end up with, um, so if we go and add in our graded string, right, so I've got to now get through all those little points. and be graded. Yep. Right, Just so transmit it through. No, I didn't want to do that. I picked the wrong string. Ah, Just blew away my geometry of my other string. All right, so, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> shouldn't have done that. Right, so you will have to ed edit your string and basically uh, pass through these points. That's the idea. I, I, I'd already done it for you, but uh, I just blew it away. Um, so um, these parts here where there's, where there's no, uh, which is the, the actual full road reconstruction, you'll obviously be able to do whatever you want in there because it's in green fields. Then these other spots, and we have options in the uh, super alignment uh, that we're not here, you know, going to show you today. Yeah, pick three points and that puts a fixed parabola in yeah. and then do a floating line through a point. So we have those sorts of tools in the, in, in the super alignment to get a fairly good result of that. Um, I'm not saying it's easy. Because um, uh, a, a lot of time when you're working with parabolas, if you change something slightly, all of a sudden it jumps up, okay, above the point, and then when you run it again, you will still end up with uh, more than 100, 100 mil, 150 mil. But it is a, a, a process you've got to make your mind up in the end um, uh, what you're willing to wear. Um, so, so running the whole job with your your um, cross falls. So if I go back into here and I run that, it's got it's going to use my reference string and cross falls only. Um, 
So obviously my reference string is not my alignment string anymore. Um, so, so we're going to end up with the same result. Um, but, but when I run that then, you'd have a nice super elevated road and it would follow your, your graded alignment string. Um, so you'd still get that final look at the overlay uh, to see if it looks all right. But I guarantee you, you won't have all, uh, everything correct. It won't be perfect all the way along. Uh, but at least you'll have a guide and you'll know where you've got to do more than 100 and, and all sorts of things. You got all those visual feedback too with the oh, death dice attacks every time you run it. That am, am I in the right area? Am I expecting that? So it won't, won't, won't be won't be perfect, but um, you certainly get feedback on where the areas where it's not perfect. Yeah. So 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 it gives you that that actual you know, good good feedback. It was the idea why we coloured the cross sections, why we did all that sort of stuff, was to give you that visual feedback. But but um, you know I'm sure that you all realise that it's not that sort of thing where it's just that's your job. Um, uh, in reality, um, this is your job, you know, so, um, so if I add in my uh, overlay tin, the job there, so I don't know where it, where it went. I, I, I hadn't, hadn't actually run it before. So, so the actual tin would, would, would sit there. So now I've got my alignment string, I went and now I want to go start to look at my actual design. Um, so, um, um, so the idea is that if I do start to look at my, my road design, part of this process was also to look at some um, um, of the attributes. Uh, yeah, yeah, of the guideposts. I've got a few things in here that I've got added to that I didn't want. Right, so look at my actual, my actual um, uh, graded road now that I've used my alignment string, I've used the, the um, uh, overlay string to get to a stage where I am. Overlay process, and I want to be able to do this now. So, a little bit of touch on the pavement again um, that we had, that we didn't get a chance to go through in any great detail on the first day. Um, but this is more of the of the overlay side of things. So, um, obviously, in the um, overlay, uh, you've done your actual design. Um, so, so inside your your job here, um, I'm looking at. Uh, an area uh, which is the full road reconstruction. I've got some aliases in there on that snippet that tells me it's RC, you know, road, road reconstruction. Um, I've got another area here which is um, um, the overlay for the approach. And these are just aliases. Uh, and I've got the overlay for the departure. Um, so there are three different areas I've got to now work with uh, to, to be able to produce the pavement. So if I go to the... To the um, uh, the reconstruction one here, and we go to our cross section now. Again, we just make sure we profile the right area. Right, so um, we look at the actual snippet. So again, we got a few things filled out before, but we have to do that. Um, right, so the the this is the one for more of a rural type. Um, uh, road, uh, not the Kerbin Channel one. Um, so I've got my aliases here, or my start and finish, and and I'm picking my my reference line, which is a point there. So my start point is my reference, and my second point is my edge of shoulder over here. And I've specified what's happening on this slope. So on that on that slope there, I have the choice between picking two links. If I've got two links in my design, uh, normally an inverted drain or a uh, or a bottom of uh, fill slope. Um, I can specify a, a, a straight out crossfall if your road doesn't uh, change or anything all the way along the road, uh, or I can do a name grade. Um, so I've got some uh, points in my job. Th this was done by a decisional template, so I do have some decent looking strings, and um, uh, I'll, I'll go apply. So if we, if we go back and, r and run this now, you'll see that that's the, the, the normal uh, reference style one, zone one. So if I go to my uh, pavement manager here, and I go to my batter, okay, then this is what it is, it's zone one, I've called it reconstruction. Um, zone number three down here is widening. So I've used those naming conventions to, to know what the hell it's all about. Um, layer one, layer two, layer three, and uh, it, it's just producing that pavement across to there. It does some good little things like this. It'll also chop off the pavement for you. Um, so if, if, the, if the drain, um, uh, you know, normally you should have your pavement lower than the drain, but they seem to do all sorts of things nowadays. And um, so it will automatically chop down there uh, uh, for you uh, if it goes past that string. 
Um, so again, I've, I've specified uh, the, the simply just the reference string, the edge of pavement string, and define this batter by, by, by whatever method I pick here. And I've then just basically uh, given this a, a, an extra alias name. Um, so when, the, when we run the pavements, um, we don't get duplications. Okay, so um, uh, obviously if I ran this further down with the same strings, I have to make sure that I, did, that I put an alias that was uh, relative to each one. I can put in um, this. So if I go apply again, um, it will run through and use this string as a cutoff rather than just the drain. So that string there was just a simple insert in my job, how many metres off this sh uh, shoulder, and uh, I stuck it onto, a, onto a, uh, a model so I could see it. That's all. Um, so it will actually chop. So you can actually position that string anywhere you want, and um, uh, it will then automatically dr drop your pavement. So it's good for things like depressed medians in the, in the roads where nowadays they only want to go out two metres or one and a half metre to do that. Um, so uh, so um, th that was fine. So if I go back and look at the area where um, that, that's full road reconstruction, it's not. Um, um, we're not doing any overlay or any corrector surfaces or anything like that. So if I now go to the to part where I am going to do this, and if I go to my modifier left, right, so I'm now looking at the, at the uh, approach, and that's what my uh, alias is saying, start to overlay approach. And if I grab that um, snippet, same one as before, but now it's doing t some different things. Okay, so instead of the, the, the end point still edge of shoulder, but I'm doing a different start point. So I'm not doing reference anymore, I'm doing uh, one of these. Okay, so I can either do a 3D cut link, right, which means that surface, to that point there. So if I turn around and pick a 3D cut link, and I go apply, then it'll run through and do this for me. It jumps up to that point, right, which is what you expect, okay. Um, but um, when you run these snippets, they, um, uh, they're not like macros, so they don't, the panel doesn't change when you do a different choice. Okay, so you will sometimes see some things in here that are filled in that are normally optional, uh, but they're all driven by what you choose here. Um, so you can muck around like this. You can turn around and say it's a 3D cut string and go apply, and it'll still turn around and do my pavement because I've actually just picked both things just because I'm demonstrating it to you. Um, but it's still pretty handy. Uh, you can sort of swap between the two. Um, so it's doing that for me. It'll do the same thing here if I turn around and, and pick up that, that um, cutback string and go apply. It'll also turn around and sawtooth cut off that for me. Um, the other one running through the top here um, is uh, straight AC. It's, it's just a, uh, a pavement style. Um, AC surface, that's it. And that will run the, the, uh, over the top, obviously, uh, and not where the reconstruction areas are. Um, so you end up with that little slither of AC pavement. Um, so you've got the ability to, be able to, to quickly um, raise your pavement if you make a decision that you're not going to do that, you're going to go for full reconstruction rather than trying to do this little corrector stuff and all that rubbish that you, did, that you sometimes get stuck with. Um, so if you decide to come back and go, no, we're going to go up and just do full pavement, you just have to change that little option and your pavement jumps up and follows the design string, especially when you're in a, more of a super elevated area. There's a big difference between putting your pavement down on the existing where it may be worth nothing uh, or to going up to full road reconstruction on the road. Um, so, so basically, um, that's the general process with those, with those snippets. Um, and there's not a great deal of, um, as I said, of um, uh, things to pick. Uh, most of the times it's you know, your normal stuff. Uh, you pick your reference string, you've got a bit of a definition here, and you've got a couple of little extra things that it does for you over there. Yeah. Uh, as I said, everything else is inside the pavement manager, and that that's where it all gets it from. Um, so what we've got left is the, um, the uh, little bit in the middle, this little bit. Okay, so, um, uh, and in other words, the corrector area. So how do I get that? So there's no real option to, to do it to a tin surface and to follow the tin surface for you. Um, but, but you can put up a, you know, create a few strings on top of your existing that reflects that layer. And you've got 
uh, for the pavements top and bottom, there's heaps of strings that are being created for you. Um, so if I add in my mesh pavement strings, there's strings in this job. Just to give you a quick idea, when all these pavements are created, um, there's normally four strings. Some of the curved ones have a few little extra ones. Um, but normally there's four strings that make up the shape. Um, there's an extra one thrown in here for this, but generally it'll be, uh, and they have names reflecting what type of pavement they are and all sorts of stuff if you do an inquiry on it. Um, but this is um, points uh, one and two, and this is A and Z. So when you start to do inquiries and do other things later on and you're looking for those names, that's all it is, just one and two across the top and A and Z down the bottom. Um, so it does make it a bit easier for, to, to pick the things because we need to pick this up. So uh, this is a, an old snippet um, that is called uh, multipoint infill. Now, um, it's a little bit different than the other one. It doesn't reference the pavement manager because it really can't because it's just picking, cherry picking points uh, for you to fill in. So um, all, the, all the strings that are created in the pavement are all on pavement layer. So you can simply just go and grab the pavement layer from the list and you'll see there's a couple of other things in here. Um, they're all uh, used inside the snippet uh, to do little magic stuff. Um, so don't worry about it. Um, so generally you've got design and uh, pavement and maybe some other strings that you may have um, created, like I've got a cutback one here. So I've done an insert absolute on some of those cutback strings to create another layer that I can pick other than design and pavement. So I tick that little guy on and I go apply. This is where I find out whether I've done something wrong or not. Because I, um, this pavement, whether I did or not. Uh, no, no, I thought I was. Okay. What's that profile the wrong one? I was looking for a nice orange area. Pretty sure I was in here. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I can't imagine see what I did wrong. Everything looks nice. I, uh, maybe. Sorry about that. Give a breakdown sometimes. Um. Anyway, just, just imagine <laughs> that there's, a, there's an orange thing in here somewhere. Uh, at, at, at the moment, I just can't figure what, what, what it is. Oh, no, that's all right. I think it, it, will, it will be there. It will just colour this bit in the middle. I think I might have, I think I should have replaced one of these strings back under there. I've, I think I haven't gone back and moved that down. Um, but generally, that's, uh, it will actually pick up that colour that area in, in, in the middle. Um, uh, so um, one of these strings I've actually missed. Um, picked, I think, that's all. Um, so so it, it, it's just a cherry pick thing. You just say, look, I want to fill this gap in. So you just go one string, two strings, three strings. You've got a maximum of, um, uh, a minimum of three and a maximum of six. So if you've got any more than six, then do it twice. Um, so, so that's about it. We've got no little extra thing to add those stuff together. So it does work fairly well. Uh, the point was that uh, you'd have to type these names in to match the pavement manager. This doesn't reflect the pavement manager. So it asks you for the old school names to type in. Um, so you better do that sort of stuff. Um, sorry? Oh, that's all right, yeah. All right, I'll, I'll just do it really fast. Right, yeah, so, so that's a general pavement. Uh, we did have on the thing saying that we're doing guideposts. And um, hopefully people didn't get excited. Um, so under the, um, uh, here there's a guidepost creator, and we'll run guideposts. <laughs> How you know? How's that, eh? I just compiled that macro this morning. <laughs> um, right, yeah, this is to say that we ha how you send reports. It's done on purpose. Um, <laughs> so, so this is how you, how, how you go and send reports to people. So while um, <laughs> dial it quickly on there, I'll endeavour to recover those rotten guideposts. Yeah, okay. Oh, that's good. Let me switch over. Now, um, I was under the impression that um, Kiwis had an immunity on the last day of conference that we didn't actually have to do talks. And so I didn't bring my computer down this morning and then I walked in and Pete goes, are you ready for this morning? 
Yeah, what? You talk you do. My what? <laughs> the thing on the three clash detection. Okay. So I went back and got my computer. So if I'm a bit dusty and if there are any technical issues, we'll just roll with it because generally I don't have to do anything to do on the third day apart from feel sorry for myself. So uh, I ran this in the drainage room and it's going to be basically 3D clash detection in about 20 minutes. Um, you'll see that my examples of my 3D objects are pretty much rudimentary. Some of the stuff that we've seen over the last three days, you know, absolutely amazing tri-meshes. We've got that spatial analysis. It's just tri-meshes, but it's just still the same tools. Mine just don't look as flash as some of the other people that have been doing these things. So just a really quick run through to clear, uh, clash detection, because there's a lot of thing out there that people are thinking, OK, 3D clash detection, yes, we do it, and it's all this nice corridor analysis, and you get all these pretty bells and whistles and reports, but there's also some other... Um, inbuilt options in 12D that are kind of ignored, but they're all about the same sort of thing. So 3D objects in 12D model. You guys have seen them over the last three days. It's now about objects. And an object can be a water string or it can be a super string. And we've got to get it away from, you know, the strings and the tins that we've traditionally had, you know, old, old people like me. <laughs> and uh, there's been lots of talk about the federal rated model being the, the one source of truth for all of your um, spatial analysis. So. 12D model actually can uh, be the one-stop shop or the, um, the ending up uh, place to, uh, for the uh, federated model to uh, identify conflicts. Right, so we've got types of objects in 12D, super strings, the good old good olds. These have a spatial position. Um, they don't have any linked uh, or attached structures. You've seen Paul's macros for those ones where you can actually create those lovely tri-meshes. You've got unlimited attributes on each vertex, segment and string. There's your metadata, there's your BIM that we're talking about. And they can have a size or a mass. It's completely up to you. You can say this super string is a diameter and it's got a diameter of X or it's a culvert with a width and a height of Y. So it gives it that spatial orientation inside 3D rather than just being a, uh, uh, basically a string. And it's used for modelling services, ducts, pipes, piles and uh, clearance corridors. Uh, then the other type of objects that we have in 12D are the water network strings. And I'm going to say drainage at least once today instead of water. Um, just forgive me, it's water, water, water. Uh, they have a spatial position. They do actually have attached structures. They've got nodes. Um, yeah, oh, that was pretty good. I didn't say pits. Nodes. Uh, they have unlimited attributes on each node, link and string, and metadata, and they have a size and the mass, which is defined by it's a link, and its link's got a width, and the pipe or a diameter is this, and the node has a thing. We've got all these new flash risers that uh, uh, come into play as well. And they can have tri-mesh objects linked to them via the drainage.4D file and a 12DA file. And clash checking features, we have them in the network editor. The other type of objects are obviously your tri-mesh objects. They have a spatial position. The object identifies what it is. Is it a toilet? Is it a sink? It's the object itself. There's no water, super string. You know, and that's what it is. Uh, you can have unlimited attributes on the object. And the size and mass can be different variations. If It can be a closed uh, trimesh, so it has a volume. It can be an open trimesh like a trench. It could be a planar trimesh like a batter slope. Okay? There's, but they are all objects within, in the 3D space. Uh, so the trimesh will come from all disciplines, you know, 12D, architecture, structural. You've seen that over the last few days. I'm not going to repeat that. Um, and trimeshes can be used in the clash detection routines inside 12D model. I guess that's the important thing to take out of that. So we've got a few methods of um, spatial clash or spatial conflict detection. We've got the good old, old iometer, and it was nice to see Steve Hunter in his talk yesterday afternoon say, you know, you've got your eyes. Uh, I thought, absolutely, I'm, I'm not the only one to do uh, who... Uh, there's an old bugger like that. So experienced designers are still good at this. I mean, you do it every time you look at the monitor. You're doing your iometer. Do I have um, you know, spatial clearance or spatial uh, connections? And do you want to run the 3D clash detection every single time you move a pit or a pipe? That's the other thing that you, know, you can make the determination with your eyes. The disadvantage, there's no record of how good your eyes actually are. All right? There's no written thing saying, I'm really, really good, and I did this on Tuesday, and I wasn't hungover, and I'm doing absolutely fine. Um, and the other one is, uh, your ability is reduced proportionate to your age and your eyesight. <laughs> All right? So your eyeometer gets worse as age goes on. So methods of spatial conflict detection in 12D. We've got the water network editor clash check. This is run from the network editor itself, and it checks for vertical separation between um, objects, drainage strings or water, there you go, water strings and um, super strings. 
uh, reports clashes in the output window, and the smart lines in the output window allow you guys to basically go straight to where those spatial conflicts occur along the water network. And I'll give you a demonstration of that. Uh, intersections. There's a forgotten old run, which is the tin to tin intersection. This is actually a spatial conflict. You've got two tins that are conflicting with each other, and there's a root in a 12D that's been there forever. Hey, they find me the intersection of two tins. Or where they conflict. Um, there's also the tri-mesh to tin, and that's like a daylighting. Where do my tri-meshes daylight within the tin so I can see where I've maybe got um, you know, objects sticking out in the middle of the road that might cause problems later on? Um, and 12D can tell me where those are in 3D space. And we also have tri-mesh intersections. So this is, I've got two tri-meshes that share the same space inside 3D. I need 12D to tell me where I've got those conflicts between those two objects. Uh, some methods for spatial conflict detection, we've got 3D clash check. This checks horizontal and vertical clashes, and it checks in a corridor. So within a corridor, uh, left width, then a right width, then a top width, then you can get really you know, complex. Um, where do those two corridors from those two objects in 3D space intersect or get close to each other, and that will be reported out. And it checks super strings versus super strings, and super strings versus water strings, and tri meshes versus super strings, and any variation of all of those with a 3D clash check. Uh, the check routine is defined by rules, and I'll show you how easy they are to set up. And the most commonly named setup is via model or name. So, like anything in 12D, if you get consistency in your model names and consistency in your model or your string names, it's a tremendous advantage because you can run the same rule set over and over and over on uh, your projects. And they can be as simple or as comprehensive uh, for corridor definition as you want them to be. They're defined by a file that's read on startup. It's called service underscore clash underscore rules dot XML. So every time you write a new rule set, you restart 12D, reads it on startup, and then you've got those rules available for the um, clash detection. So the file can be saved as a user-based um, uh, rule set or a project-based rule set. And an example file is installed with 12D model, both version 12 and version 14. Right. Uh, oh, yeah, I'll do that one if I can go back. Trimesh objects, because they're not linear, they don't create the corridor objects. Okay, so you see there's no corridor objects where you've got two trimeshes and, uh, and intersecting together, although it will report it out. So let's have a little bit of a line of demonstration. And as I say, I did this initially in the water room. Um, so if you've seen this before, my apologies, but there may be some people who they haven't sort of dived into the water network editor and aren't aware that there's a really nice and easy thing for that first check of your clashes. Um, I've got a here we go. Bum services. There we go. And I've got a long section. Bum section. There we go. So I'll just move that onto the left hand side and move that one over to the right hand side and we'll be all good to go. No, no, there we go. Burp services. Bear with me. As I said, I'm a bit dusty this morning. <laughs> oh, come on. Okay, so very quickly fire up the water network editor and show you what a clash file looks like. So I'll just load up this model. And you can see we've got the other um, uh, super strings and other drainage elements that are actually turned on with, within the models of the section. And this will help us identify where things are going wrong. So this is done under the global utility models and you can have a service clash file. And that service clash file just defines everything in this model, I need to have this vertical clearance between the object that I'm checking against the water network. Um, you know, gases and uh, 200 for the design and anything that, any other sanitary sewer lines, I need 150 mils clearance, and it will do these vertical checks and reports for you. And that's activated by hitting the set node details. And it'll report in the output window under smart lines. So if I just get rid of that for now, go to the output window, it will warn me where I don't have problems, where the service clash clearance is okay from this string to this string, or this pipe and link to this link at this particular chain, it's just all okay. And it'll report where I have service clash problems at particular areas. And as I say, these are smart lines, so I can basically just go and double click on those and 12 people take me in plan and section to the exact link where I've got those clashes. And it'll also give me a bit of an idea. If you lower the cover RL to this, you might actually get rid of that clash detection. So that's the water network editor. Um, some of the other really, really simple ones. Now, you saw Paul. Did Paul do his, his flash uh, pits and stuff, his yep. trimishes? Yeah. Well, I'm low tech, okay, but it's still kind of valid. Uh, we've surprised actually how many people didn't use the um, 
or didn't use the CAD holes when they're putting their hands up yesterday. That's really, really quite interesting. Right, so I've got some services here. I've got a polygon, and I'll just clear it there, that port window so things get a little bit faster. And I've got a polygon that's got a CAD hole attached to it. I mean, you can create these objects in space really, really easy. They can be something as simple, BIM, tri-mesh. I want to create a tri-mesh from a polygon. And I'm going to pick that polygon, and I'm going to have this model, and the model is going to be maybe 100 mils above the actual level of the string itself, so it's got a bit of a um, riser above the um, tin level. And the depth, just bear with me here. Yep, I'll just do something. I'll just drape that onto the tin first. I put this one in. Uh, 0.5, yep, pass up. There's two of these strings. That one go drape, finish, so that'll actually... Oh, no, it did have 3D. Pardon? What am I doing? Anyway, um, the depth is going to be one metre for that chamber. And if you're using hole strings and you don't do anything else, you can just say, I want to include the holes, and it will create basically a chamber with a wall thickness based on the inner polygon. Um, if you also want to make a tri-mesh uh, tri from that inner poly polygon, you can put that into a different model. So I'm going to actually have a Z offset of 0 0.2 on that one. It's going to go 200 mils, and maybe it's 150 mils thick, so it's sort of a very quasi lit inside a chamber. So if I generate that and redraw that view, hopefully that'll pop up. No, nope. ET chamber, turn that off. Okay, that's the chamber that's made based on that polygon. And the inside chamber, there's a little bit of a lid inside there, okay? But we're just creating some objects in 3D that we can do spatial checks against. And I've also created a tri-mesh from a tin so you'll see here when we do the uh, intersection of two tri-meshes, I've got a design tin that that chamber basically cuts through, right? or hopefully cuts through. Um, so intersection checks. You can have the good old tins analysis, and you can do an intersection of two tins. I'd like you to show me where the survey tin intersects with the design. We'll create a model from that, calculate that out, and if I open a, that loop, a plan view, Remove everything off and go to an intersection. Okay, there's where super strings are created, where the two tins intersect. Okay, it's a spatial conflict between those two tins. It's a good old option, and you can get things that are a little bit flasher, obviously. Um, so we have these drainage strings, and we have these tri-mesh objects that are reference to them from the drainage.4 default. These things aren't actually there. So there's options in 12D, not only for the water strings, but also for your visualization elements that I can actually bring those into the database as 3D objects. I need to convert them to actual tri-meshes, so rather than just a reference, um, they're physically inside the project. So that's options under the bin tri-mesh create. You can create from 12D model objects, and you can create Basically, I'm going to convert everything in this SW network, all element types. Uh, the new model is going to start with a prefix of SW. You can also copy over all of the attributes from the water string onto the trimesh object straight away when you're doing the conversion. And if I generate that, I have created a new model. And I'm pretty sure I've got a new view for it. No. Uh, views create. Perspective OpenGL. Turn on that model. And this is my complete water network converted into tri-meshes, but you'll see rather than these elements being referenced, if I do a string inquire on them, the tri-mesh objects have actually come inside and been created inside the database, so I can run the uh, 3D clash check against them or the spatial analysis. I already have all the links in the nodes, all the pits and the pipes. I don't want those, so I'm just going to do a really, really quick routine. That's just going to clean those out. So I'm just going to get everything that's in that model that's been converted, um, go and choose it, or by filter select, but then don't choose anything that has the word lil and mh in it. I don't know whether you've you used the name masks, but in the name masks, there's a not. Go and pick everything apart from this, and it's quite a little handy little feature. So if I go and filter select those and delete those, all I'm left with is the trimesh objects from the grates and the, and the um, lintels, as it were. So looking at some of these intersection options, under the BIM tri-mesh intersection, 
can't see it, but don't. it's intersectionalized. I can do the intersections of trimeshes and a tin. I'd like to see where everything in this SW pits model, actually, I will do this view. actually intersects with uh, this tin design. And it's going to create uh, super strings in a model called intersection try tin. If I intersect those through and turn on that model. A bit hard to see until I turn the tri meshes off, but it's actually created a super string, the exact shape where the, that tri mesh penetrates through the tin. It's like a daylighting op uh, option. And if I turn off that SW pits, you'll see that we're actually left with a super string where that object's daylighted out through the tin. Really nice handy way of seeing uh, very quickly turning those on in models or reporting them out in a report file. Do I have a problem where my, um, you know, my manhole covers are sticking up through the um, seal and it's going to cause problems. So you can do those intersections of a uh, tri-mesh and a tin and you can also do an intersection of um, two tri-meshes together. So if I go back to the water chamber there and turn on the UT chamber. Both of those. And those. Right. I'm going to do another intersection option, but it's an intersection of two tri meshes. So I'd like to create super strings where the tri mesh from the um, tin, the tri tin design, don't hit asterisks. And this is like where they, uh, where they share the same space or penetrate each other. So from the tritin design to these UT chambers, I'm going to create a model called intersection trimeshes, run an insect on that, turn those on. I don't know where that asterisk is coming from. It's just my big thick fingers today. Did I turn that one off? Intersection trimeshes, I did. Yes. Just can't see anything at the moment. Now, if I turn off those tri meshes themselves, yeah, thanks, Pete. It's getting like that. Oh no, that's an object uh, object fail. Try to design, try UT chamber. See, this is what happens when you get pulled in the last minute. Try UT chamber. And it should create an intersection of those two tri meshes, and I think I know why it hasn't done it. Nope, intersection two tins. Nope, okay, I'll move on from that one. Because you guys. Join the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you guys are wanting lunch, it's always happens on the last day. Um, and we'll start having a look at the actual 3D clash check analysis. So, as I said, it's run from rules. So, it's under the BIM check clash, clash detection in version 14, it's under the utilities A to G. Class detection inside version 12. If you want to give it a give it a go when you get back to the office, and it's under the clash detection I, I, items. And the clash detection items start with these thing called rules. And you can have uh, your main uh, level of rules, and you can have different rule sets. And underneath these rule sets, you can have different child sets that says, under this rule set, I need to check this particular group of objects or this group of objects and you can be as comprehensive as you want or you can be as simple as you want. I've got one here called all services and that'll check all variations, water versus gas and storm water versus gas and you know all those two, two things. Um, and it's got some colours in here and I've got a gas one and I've got some tri mesh where I can check uh, storm waters versus tri meshes and any variations of the two. Uh, but I'm just going to create a new rule set and I'm going to call this simple. Drain is simple. And this rule set is going to just have one check drainage. Drainage. You'll forgive the spelling. So you give it a good description, and you've got these models. So you can check either on an object basis individually, or you can check on an overall model. I'm just going to check every model that basically has the word SW, all the characters SW in it. Um, and I'm going to give that a particular color, maybe give it a cyan color for the uh, corridors, and the models to check against, go and check against everything, all the strings, no matter what type, or dry meshes that are strings that are in a um, model called SS, I should say. Give that a color red. And it can be as simple as, I just want a combined horizontal clearance between any objects within that data set of maybe 0 0.2. 
and I want a combined vertical clearance of everything in that data set of 200 millimetres. And when it comes to the water strings, you can be really, really specific or comprehensive. You can say, from a pit top, I need this clearance. From the left-hand side of a pit, I need this one. From the bottom of a pit, and you can set them up as, as I say, as comprehensively as you like. If I just write that away, and I'll write that into the current folder. So I'm writing back that XML file. If I do a project restart, so it'll read that rule set again, right at startup. Oh, there's some files, isn't there, Pete, that are sneaking in that you don't have to do the startup on. Mm -hmm. I've heard in uh, Watch Now in version 14. So we'll just have a have a go at um, uh, Han and see whether that can be one of them. Okay, so that's doing a restart. By the way, all this is, a, there's some tremendous, the graphs and the, the diagrams that you saw, Han, there's an expansion on that in the help file, in version 12. When you're on this option, go press on F1, and it's amazing the guidance that you'll get and some uh, pitfalls that you will want to avoid when you're doing the 3D clash check. Okay, so let's put that through there. I have a view that's already set up with some uh, data in it. Uh, I've got two models there, my SW and my SS, and I'm gonna go and run that via a layout file. So I'll just do a uh, clash drainage simple. Go and check all of the models that are in this particular view using this drainage simple and the core to arc tolerance if you've got horizontal or vertical arcs and it's gonna create these models. So the data uh, for in the four that was in that, it was everything that was in the SW model. That's my four model. My against is anything that's in that SS model. And so it's gonna create corridors where there is conflicts of those two that you can see visually. And it creates um, corridor strings in the model to check corridors, corridor strings in the check against, which would be my SS. And it also creates tri-meshes in 3D so you can see the exact shape of the spatial conflict between those two corridor uh, overlaps. Gives you a PDF report. And if I could just run check on that one, it'll detect the potential clashes. And if I open up the PDF file once it's been reported, there's your record, which you don't have with your iometer, you know, under check drainage, I've got six potential clashes in there at this coordinate between this object and this object. And it creates these corridor models. So if I go CHK and just turn on the check uh, four, so that was my SW. And if I turn on the check against, that's anything in that other data set that I was checking against. And where you have these clash uh, or spatial conflicts, it can also create a trimesh. I don't know where that asterisk is coming from, but I'm having one of those days. And it's a bit hard to see at the moment, so if I can turn off those two, all those drainage models, you can see the corridors that it's made down the 12D objects that are linear, and the trimesh that it's done, and it's reported all those clashes, all those potential areas, also in the output window. So we've got the report file, which you can print out, put in the paper, you know, or put in Synergy, and that's your, your BIM check. But if you're doing this dynamically, under the output window, it's listed all of those object conflicts as well. And what I can do is I can just start cycling through those inside my output window and go and see where we've got the 3D clash or the spatial conflicts in those particular areas. So as I say, it can be really uh, simple, really comprehensive, and you can check uh, water elements, super strings versus tri-meshes, you can check them all. Um, just on that, there's the new one uh, where you've got your tins. So you can say, all well, my water elements have to be at least 600 millimetres below this tin or above this tin. When I did the starter set, I didn't have version 14, but that's one of the new ones that's in there that Han was showing you. And um, getting to the stage where you can go and do the full Monty, and it doesn't really take very long at all. 3D clash all services. There we go. So I've got some different elements in there. I've got some super string elements and some water elements and some other tri-mesh elements. Uh, and if I just go and run the all, I'm going to be checking everything that's in this view. Sorry. Three, oh, three minutes. Oh, Pete's giving me a hurry. Okay, right, uh, and I'm going to use that rule set all services. And that rule set all services was I had all the elements checked: uh, stormwater versus sewer, check gas versus electricity, and all variations. Let it all go, and it's going to create these models. Check all four. It's going to give me a PDF file, and if I replace those, I'll have a lot more items of con in conflict in the report file in the PDF. So I'll have clashes, you know, where the stormwater uh, clashes with the wastewater, where the gas clashes with the electricity of particular places. And it's, you see it's a nice little context as PDF file as well, so you can go and check the ones that you're really interested in. And if I go and turn on the all models, 
where you've got all different variations of spatial conflicts. It's again reported in the output window, nicely itemized, and you can go through and basically zoom in 3D space. I find 3D space much, much easier than zooming through in plan, but you can of course see all those trimeshes in plan and the corridors in plan. Well, there's a, there's a good few banked through there. So essentially your 3D spatial clash check in 12D is the uh, main ones is run through there. And that's me. Thank you very much. I do have to, I have to show the last slide, eh? Yeah. yeah, I have to show the last little bit. Uh, I apologise for I do have You're a reason Michael? why that overlay didn't work. Didn't I, yeah. No. Be near me anyway. Right, I do have a reason why that corrector surface didn't work. Remember when I said my alignment string got blown away? It didn't have my nice design. It had the one with the overlay, which is all too low. Uh, so that's why I didn't do that corrector surface. So it wasn't me. Um, the the um, guidepost one, uh, under the design roads guidepost, it brings up, I said I apologise, I made a bit of a change this morning, I probably should have checked it more. Um, so it picks a reference line and two shoulder, str shoulder strings, it's got a distance for the um, uh, straights and so forth, and spacing, and it'll, it'll, it'll calculate and work out as based on an on a internal table, uh, what spacing you need for a particular radius and all that sort of stuff, and it's now a trimesh. But I will do a little bit more work on that one. Um, I got uh, uh, sort of uh, sidelined, and um, so uh, uh, it, some people ask for they only want to do a turnout, they only want to do guide posts on just one string, not both sides of the road, um, and maybe that external, that internal table, uh, they want to be able to enter their own. So look for something, you know, possibly a few little changes on this. But basically, at the moment it, it'll run. It creates a uh, a trimesh shape for you. Um, so inside here, you can add the the um, a guide paste into the section view now, and um, you have a, 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 a proper trimesh. Um, so I will do a little bit more on that, um, uh, just based on what people are, are asking back. Um, just to finish with, um, when um, I was, did my presentation yesterday, I was uh, um, uh, then Steve had his speech after, and I sort of took that into into uh, uh, context, and I thought about it for a while. And I thought, well, he's probably right. And, um, you know, sort of the, all these Love Island people. So um, I think we'll probably just end up with a bridge like that one. Um, so um, just a nice little box so, so that, um, um, you know, we can work like that. But it really didn't last too long. I didn't think too much about it. I was more upset about the fact that more of you knew about Love Island than you made out. <laughs> um, so I thought, well, yeah, that's okay. It doesn't look like a bridge, but it's purpose built and everything. But I really do think that um, it'd be better if we had a Love Island bridge and we had that one. <laughs> so, so I think that's a, not as much detail and uh, gives you a good idea what's going on. So, I, so I'd like to take credit for that, but it's not really mine. Um, so, it just uh, Paul found the internet somewhere and we read it in. So, uh, anyway, so I hope it all uh, is probably towards the end of what I'll be doing. So, yes. um, do you take questions here in this room? It's my first time in this room, the whole no, conference. We don't take I was quick. expecting to be sitting right up the back actually listening to you, Pete. No, we don't have questions. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, sorry, if you want some, or you're, if you're nearly 12D, you're probably all hungry. So, uh, that, that's about all we've got. Thank you very much.